everyone. Uh, welcome back to STEM Coding's astronomy videos. Uh, today we're going to look at orbital motion. So uh, a few videos ago, if you remember, we did this video called Slingshot with Gravity. And what we learned in that video is that uh, objects tend to orbit in elliptical orbits. Uh, for example, like this. Um, so objects in space tend to orbit other bigger objects in elliptical orbits. Uh, and that is actually Kepler's first law. In this new activity we have, we're going to investigate more into Kepler's second law, which states that the, as it's going around in its elliptical orbit, like you can see here, um, the time it takes for it to go around this or to sweep this area one is going to be the exact same time it takes for it to sweep this other area here, area two. So I know it looks really weird. Uh, how can it actually sweep this area one um, at the same, like this small, it looks small. How can it sweep this sort of small looking area one at the same time as it sweeps this bigger looking area two? But uh, you'll learn that these two areas are actually going to be exactly the same. So let's get to doing this activity. Okay. So welcome everyone. When you start the activity, you'll be on this page. And then in step one, it will say click here to open the code from the end of the slingshot with gravity activity. As soon as you click this, it'll open up a new web editor. And here you can see different values listed for X, Y, VX, VY, and so forth. And if you click play, you'll notice that you see a diagram of this planet moving around the sun. Um, and it says right now to click and drag the mouse to launch the object, but we haven't put in that functionality just yet. Okay, now we can begin to input new pieces of this code. So go back to the previous tab and here's all this code with t counter one plus equals dt. Um, and draw text and more things to actually make an animation of Kepler's second law. So you're going to click on copy to clipboard, go back to your editor, and you're going to paste that near the end of the draw function, but before this line here that says do not add any code after this line. So I'm going to put it here around line 45, where I just control V to paste. And now we play. Okay, so you'll notice up here that you can see the counter time and the period. And each time the planet orbits the sun, um, the period gets reset based on the previous counter measurements. And if you let this run long enough, you'll see that the period bounces around between 22 and 22.1. So this is pretty accurate. Okay, and now the next thing we wanna do is actually consider what the areas look like. So to get the areas, um, we'll stop this for a moment. We'll go back to the previous tab where in step two it says show all the areas. Again, we copy the, the code to the clipboard and then I go back to the web editor and I put this, um, I'll put this right underneath where I put the last bit of code. So again, before it in draw. And now if we play that, you'll see that this looks slightly different. There are these area two and area one that pop up. Um, they start out with NAN, which stands for not a number because the code doesn't initially have any areas to give you before you start it. And as the code continues on, you'll see that area one gets some value and area two gets some value. Now these values in principle should be the same because the um, period that we're looking at between the two um, orbit periods is the same, but they aren't exactly the same because of numerical reasons with the code. Now, how much are these two areas off? Um, Kepler's second law tells us that the area should be the same because it's the same amount of time we're looking at, which ends up being one eighth of the total period in this case, but they're pretty close in the actual code. Um, so how close are they? What we can do um, is calculate the percent difference. We can do this by comparing the measured value, compare it to the true value, subtracting those, taking the absolute value, dividing that answer by the true value, and then multiplying that final answer by 100 to get the percent. 
Now, in this case, we don't really know what the true area is supposed to be because we have two different measurements. Um, so we can model um, what is true, either using area one or area two because it'd be equally va valid. So if you prefer, um, where you see measured, you can write area one, and where you see true, you can write area two, or the opposite, where you see measured, you can write area two, and where you see true, you can write area one. Um, the result should be very close to the same. Um, and when you multiply that by 100, we'll get percent. So what I'm going to do is we'll come back here, we'll run the code again, and we'll get a few different values that pop up for area one and area two. Now, um, for those of you that might not be able to write quick enough to capture all these numbers, you can always right click on the screen and click save image as, and then the image that you um, save will be a snapshot of what you're looking at here. It'll be roughly equivalent to using the print screen function on your laptop. So let's demonstrate how to actually um, save these areas. So right now I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna click on save image as, um, and I should warn you that some different browsers might have slightly different notations for what they call save image as, but it should be more or less the same. So I'm just gonna name this file um, snapshot one to make it easier. Um, and now, because that took me a little bit of time to write, I'm gonna save an image and I'm gonna call it snapshot two. And I will do this for two more snapshots. Save an image, call it snapshot three. Save. And we'll save this one last image, call it snapshot four. And just for the sake of giving my computer a break, I will stop the playing. And now we'll move on to my desktop where I have the images stored. So, so from snapshot one, okay, if you can see these values, um, Daniela has volunteered to write these down for us and put them into a spreadsheet. So, tell me what the values are for area one. Um, Four one two three point nine four. Okay. And area and two. Area, and then area two for that one is four zero four six point eleven. Okay. Okay. Snapshot two is loading four one zero seven point thirty one. Mm-hmm. And the area two is 4046.24. Mm -hmm. um, and oops, snapshot three is 4099.05 for area one. And area two is 4049.9. Mm -hmm. Last, we have snapshot four, which gives us 4090.83 for area one, and 4031.81 for area two. All right. Uh Got those numbers written down. Awesome. Thanks, Jamor, for those area one and area two values. So what I'm going to do now is calculate the percent error. Now, I know Jamor mentioned that uh, you could choose either one to be the true value. But in order to be a little more accurate, how about if we take the average of both area one and area two and call that the true value? So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna say the percent error is gonna equal 100, because that's how we're gonna make it a percent, times the absolute value, and we're gonna call the absolute value ABS, 
of the measured area minus the true area um, and then divided divided by the true area. But like I mentioned, uh, in order to, since we don't have a true area, we're just gonna take the average of both. So in reality, what we're gonna do is um, say measured minus average divided by average. So this is gonna be the equation we're gonna use. So let's start, um, let's start uh, calculating each piece by piece. So first we're gonna start with the average. And after we take the average, I'm gonna uh, calculate this difference and take the absolute uh, value of that. So I'll just call this difference. And once we have these two pieces, we can figure out the percent error. So Excel is pretty smart at doing math for you. So to take the average, what I'm gonna do is say, tell Excel to get area one plus area two and divide it by two, right? Because that's how we get the average. And then what I can do is grab, once I click this, I can grab this um, little box and drag it down and it calculates the area for everything at once. So like I said, Excel is pretty smart and it's pretty handy to help us do all this math. Um, okay, now I'm gonna find the difference. So to find the difference, uh, remember it's, I'm taking the absolute value of the difference. So let me just write that down here. Um, so it's the absolute value of the difference. And in order to do that, again, I'm gonna tell Excel to find the absolute value of um, area two, area one, I'll call that the measured value, um, minus area, minus the average, because that's gonna be our true value. And if I hit enter, that is the absolute value of our difference. So again, since Excel is smart, I'm gonna make it do the work for me, just drag it down, and there we have the difference. Okay, so now since we have this piece of the equation and this piece of the equation, all we have to do is multiply these two pieces by 100 to get the percent error. So I'm gonna multiply 100, or actually in Excel, you have to put equal first in order for it to tell it you wanna do math. So I'm gonna say 100 times uh, this absolute value of the difference. And then I'm gonna divide by the average. And I hit enter and that's our percent error. We have 0.9. Now you can see that our error is actually less than 1%. That is amazing. With our code, uh, we're able to see that both areas are almost the same uh, value. Of course, we can improve this uh, if we low, lower our DT. Um, and if you try it on your own, take different snapshots and calculate the percent error on your own, you'll see that this percent error should eventually go down to zero um, or very, very close to zero. So go ahead, try that on your own, but we can at least celebrate that our percent error is less than 1%.